time for the grand finale. Free response number 3. A triangular rod shown above has length of L, mass of M. So let's make sure we don't forget these things. Length is L, mass is M, and a non-uniform linear mass density. Oh, why can't it be uniform? Given by the equation, lambda is 2m over L squared x, where x is the distance from one end of the rod. And they want us to use integral calculus to show that rotational inertia of the rod about its left hand is ml squared over 2. How do you calculate the rotational inertia? You integrate r squared dm. And in our case, we can find r squared, that's simply x, because you're looking at the distance from x equals to 0. But how do you find dm? Well, dm is equal to lambda times dx, because lambda is linear mass density, that's mass per distance. So if you multiply this by distance, then you should get differential mass. Mass, mass over distance times differential distance is going to get you the dm. So in our case, we have integral. We're going from 0 to l. So let's remember that. 0 to l of r squared. And we know r is x. So x squared. And dm is lambda dx. And lambda is 2m over l squared x. And we want to make sure we put dx. And we want to integrate this symbolically. Let's take all of the constants outside. 2m over l squared integral from 0 to l of x cubed dx. Or 2m over l squared. And we have x to the fourth over 4 from 0 to l. Also known as 2m over l squared times l to the fourth over 4. And when you simplify this, we have ml squared on the top and 2 down below as we should. So we have shown that it's ml squared over 2. Now let's go to part B. The thin hoop shown above in figure 1 has a mass of m, radius of l, and a rotational inertia around the center of ml squared. So we know for this one, the rotational inertia is ml squared. Three rods identical to the rod from part A are now fastened to the thin hoop as shown in the figure 2 above. Derive an expression for the rotational inertia i total of the hoop rods system about the center of the hoop. Express your answer in terms of ml and physical constants. So we want to find the rotational inertia about the center of the hoop. Well, we can just add up the rotational inertia of the individual components of the system about the center. So i total is going to be the rotational inertia of the hoop, which is ml squared, and the rotational inertia of each of the rods. And remember, when we found the rotational inertia of the rods, we found it about the left hand of the rod. So, and, and since we have the left hand placed in the center of the hoop, as we can see, that's placed in the center. We don't have to make any modification to ml squared over 2. And we can just say ml squared over 2. And we have 3 of them. So what is this? When you add them up, you should get 5 ml squared over 2. Going on to part C. The hoop rod system is initially at rest and held in place but is free to rotate about its center. A constant force F is exerted tangent to the hoop for time delta t. So this wheel is essentially spinning around the center. It's not moving to the left or moving to the right. It's just rotating in place about the center. Because there is a force, because there is a force applied to it for time delta t. Tangent, tangent to the hoop. Okay. Derive an expression for the final angular speed omega of the hoop rod system. And of course, since we are applying force to it, and since we want to establish a connection between the force and the angular speed, the first thing that should come to your mind is the intermediate of torque. Because torque, in this case, because the force is exerted tangent to the hoop, the angle between the vector from the center to the point of contact and the force is 90 degrees, which means our torque is simply going to be force times the radius. So in our case, our torque is FL, and as you know, torque is equal to 
moment of inertia times angular acceleration. So we can find the angular acceleration using this, which is FL over I. And since we are starting at rest, and we are speeding up for time delta t, our, our omega, our final speed, should be our angular acceleration times delta t, because we are starting at rest. You can do plus zero, but that doesn't really matter. And we get FL over I times delta t. And we have to put it in the form ML F and delta t. We cannot have I. So let's substitute the value in for I. So we have FL over 5 ML squared over 2 delta t. And this is what? We have 2 F delta t and ML down below and also a 5. Before you get excited, we're not done by the way, there is also part E and part D to complete, so this problem is going on forever. The hoop rods system is rolling without sleeping, classic rolling without sleeping problem, along a level horizontal surface with the angular speed omega found in part C. At time t of 0, the system begins rolling without sleeping up a ramp, as shown in the figure above. On the figure of the hoop rods system below, draw and label the forces, not components, not components, so don't break up gravity into the one parallel to the incline and one perpendicular to the incline, don't do that, just draw one gravity vector that act on the system. Each force must be represented by a distinct arrow starting at and pointing away from the point at which the force is exerted on the system. Well, gravity is going to act on the center of mass. You can think of the net gravity force as acting on the center of mass going directly down towards the center of the Earth. So that should be force of gravity. And you also have normal force exerted by the surface perpendicular to the surface. So we also have the normal force. And we of course have friction. And the common mistake that people make for the friction is it going to be kinetic friction or static friction? And you may say kinetic because it's moving, but that's wrong. You have to use static friction. And what's the reason for that? The reason is that we are rolling without slipping. And kinetic friction is only when one object is slipping against another or sliding. Sliding is a better word to use. Sliding past another object past another object. And in our case, we don't, we're not sliding past one another, we are instantaneously having contact with the ground and popping right back up for each of the points. So we aren't really sliding past each other to generate the kinetic friction. So we should use static friction that's trying to prevent the system from slipping or sliding or rubbing against the surface. And the second common mistake is the static friction going to point up or point down? In our case, you may say because it's going up the ramp, it's rolling upward, as they told us, slipping up a ramp, not slipping, rolling without slipping up a ramp, you may say maybe it should point downward, but that's wrong. It should be pointing upward. And of course, it acts on the point of contact. So the force of friction, static, should point up the ramp from the point of contact. Why is it going up when it's rolling upwards? Well, if it was a block, let's say it was a block. So let's say you have an incline, incline, and you have a block sliding, so not rotating, not rolling. If the, if the book was sliding up the ramp, then surely you're going to have kinetic friction. You're going to have kinetic friction acting to oppose the motion. But in our case, we don't have kinetic friction. And the static friction is not necessarily going to oppose the direction of the motion. What static friction is going to do, it's going to oppose potential sliding, potential sliding or slipping. So that's what static friction is going to avoid. And if you look at this diagram, gravity is trying to push this entire wheel down this way. So the gravity is trying to make this entire wheel slide against the surface down below because the gravity is pushing it down below. And to overcome that, to oppose the potential sliding due to gravity, the frictional force, the static friction force should go up the ramp. 
And also, and another fun fact, if the wheel was rolling down the ramp without slipping, then the frictional force is still going to point upwards because the same thing is happening with gravity. It's going to try to oppose it. So for number two, justify your choice for the direction of each of the forces found in part D1. Well, force of gravity is the easiest one. It's going to point towards the center of the earth, towards the center of the earth, center of the earth, so directly downward. And F sub n, the normal force should be perpendicular to the surface or point of contact. And finally, the static frictional force is opposing, opposing slippage, slippage due to gravity, due to gravity, gravity attempting to, attempting to slide the wheel down the ramp, down the ramp. So that's the answer for part, part D, I believe. And off to the final part, E. Derive an expression for the change in height of the center of the hoop. Well, we have all this information about angular speed, velocity, and all those. And now we're looking at change in height. So obviously, we're looking at conservation of energy problem. Conservation, if I can spell it, conservation of energy problem energy, where we are going from the kinetic energy to the gravitational potential energy at the top, the moment it reaches the bottom of the ramp until the moment it reaches the maximum height. So we want the initial kinetic energy to be equal to the final gravitational potential energy. So how can we find this? Well, initial kinetic energy, because you're rolling without slipping, and whenever you're rolling without slipping, there is kinetic energy due to the translational motion, translational motion of the center of mass, and the kinetic energy due to rotation, because the center of mass is translating up the ramp, and because the wheel is rotating. So we have to add up the two different types of kinetic energies. The first one is of course one half mv squared. But what's the what's the value of mass? You gotta be careful because the wheel has mass of m, and each of the rod has mass of m. So we have four of those, so the total mass should be 4m. Make sure you don't mess this up. 4m times v squared plus kinetic energy for the rotation, that's 1 half i omega squared, i total times omega squared, and we want this thing to be equal to 4mgh, that's the mass. That's the acceleration due to gravity, and this is the maximum height. Okay, so let's simplify the left part before we go on. We have, for the left part, we have, we have to find the expression for the velocity of the center of the mass, which is, the velocity of the center of the mass is the radius, which in this case is L, times the omega. So we have 1 half 4m times LW squared, we're squaring this entire thing. So L squared, omega squared, plus one half total moment of inertia, omega squared, and we can factor one half and omega squared out of it. And we have 4m L squared, 4m L squared plus I total left. So we know this thing, we know this thing is equal to 4m GH max, and we want to find the maximum height which is simply 1 over 8m omega squared, 4ml squared plus i total. If you want to, you can simplify this even more by plugging in the value for the total moment of inertia. But if you read the question, it says we can express our answer in terms of ml, total moment of inertia, and omega. So you don't really have to simplify this. And really, when you're taking the AP test, you do not want to spend more time unless you have to. So that's really as far as you have to go. And that's the answer for the final question on the AP Physics C, Mechanics Free Response.